Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm Todd, and speaking English is okay? I'm sure it's okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, no, it isn't? What do you want, French? I can speak French. I can speak Italian. I can speak, but I can't speak Dutch. So as uh, Miriam said, um, we're really happy to be here. Uh, two students who work with me, uh, they're studying for their doctorates at MIT, have been running this workshop this week. So in a little bit, you'll see some incredible work that's been done just for the past few days. But I wanted to start by giving you a little bit of background about how we're thinking about music today and music in the future, uh, sometimes with technology and sometimes maybe not with technology, but a different kind of music. And I'll tell you a little bit about this and that will, I think, prepare uh, for some of the workshop ideas. Anybody know what this picture is? What? You say, I can't hear it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, she's good, yeah. So, so as I understand it, one reason why this whole event is happening today and I think other days is that 100 years ago, from, this, uh, from the month of June actually, uh, in 2013, uh, Igor Stravinsky, uh, here was Stravinsky back in, 2000, uh, in uh, 1913, uh, premiered his piece, Le Sacre du Printemps, The Rite of Spring. And as I'm sure you've heard, uh, it was a big scandal for the audience. Uh, some of the audience loved it. Some of the audience really hated it. There were fights in the audience. But more importantly than that, probably more than any other piece uh, in maybe the history of music, it represented so many different ideas about music all at once. Ideas about the melody wasn't so clear, where's the melody? Harmonies were not the chords that everybody was used to. Uh, the way the piece developed, uh, it didn't have clear sections like p normal classical pieces, but especially the rhythm, which was so uh, powerful and repetitive and not the kind of um, even symmetrical phrases like classical music. It was really shocking. And it's, in, it's kind of incredible that uh, 100 years later, uh, if you hear a really good performance of the Sacre du Printemps, or if you see uh, like this production, <clears throat> which was just in London, the whole idea, it's still a pretty shocking piece. Uh, that's Stravinsky down at the bottom conducting uh, near the end of his life. Um, but it's, it's a piece that was revolutionary in its time and has stayed extremely fresh. But we're 100 years later, and the world has changed even further than that. So what we think about at the Media Lab, I think what a lot of you think about, is where's music now and where is it in the future? And I've spent a lot of my career uh, exploring some pretty unusual kinds of ways that music can be made, uh, exploring the idea of, is, is, does music have to only be created by a famous composer? Can music be created by many people together? Uh, does music only get performed by people who go to conservatory? Can, can people collaborate who have different levels of expertise. Does music have to be played on traditional instruments? What role does electronics have? Uh, what role does live performance have? And what role does technology have in many ways? So we push all of these ideas as far as possible. And I kind of started thinking about these things, um, maybe not as long ago as Stravinsky, but a pretty long time ago. Um, when I was a kid, um, that's me in the middle, and uh, those, are, those are my parents. So um, I grew up in New York. And I was lucky because my parents together represented a lot of these different ideas in two people. So my father uh, was one of the people who started the field of computer graphics. So he was an engineer, but he was one of the early people who believed that technology would only be useful to people if it could be very, very natural and intuitive, if people could use it with their normal habits. So he had one of the first companies that figured out how to make pictures on a computer screen. They had light pens in those days, no mouse, uh, but a pen with light that you could draw pictures with and select things. And um, when I was a little kid, we, you know, his factory was nearby and I used to go and see all these things being built. And I think because of that, I always had an idea that technology wasn't a bunch of kind of nice apps on an iPhone or slick software. Technology is, is a very, very, uh, creative and evolving medium that lets you bring new things into the world from your imagination. It's still that way today. And although I have an iPhone and I love apps, I think especially for students, the thing to remember is that technology is, a, is, is probably the best tool we have 
to make things in the world that uh, don't exist now. So that's what I saw with my father and I still remember it. And my mom uh, is still a, a very well-known piano teacher. She went to Juilliard Conservatory in New York and um, specializes in teaching piano, but also in teaching creativity to kids. So when I was a little, little tiny kid, um, I, I'm the oldest child in the family. So I was, do you know the word guinea pig? In French, you say corbeille. In Dutch, I have no. I was like the experiment in the family. So when she was learning how to teach, we'd have a group of a few kids, maybe three years old, four years old, and we'd have our piano lessons. And then my mother would say, okay, let's just stay for 10 more minutes and I'll give you three minutes and go anywhere in the house and each of you bring back some object, anything you find that makes an interesting sound. So we'd all run around the house and we'd bring something from the kitchen or a lamp or a book or I don't know, rip the house apart and come back. And then she'd say, okay, what sound does that make? That sound, oh, great. What's the softest sound you can make with that? What's the loudest sound? Oh, okay, great. What does it sound like if we play those two at the same time? Or, oh, okay, great. Can you think of any words to describe those sounds we just made? Okay, great, words uh, that's rough or, or smooth or funny. Okay, with these sounds and these words, let's tell a story. How, how do you want to start the story? What should happen? And so we'd sit there for 10 or 15 minutes, and with those sounds, we'd make a story. And of course, the story was a piece of music, and it was a composition. And then we'd finish, we'd play it, and she'd say, okay, when you go home this week, make a picture of what we just did. So when you come back next week, we'll look at the picture and we'll try it again. So in those little experiments, when we were little kids, I learned that music wasn't just things written on a page by mostly dead people, and it wasn't, you know, a musical system wasn't just a set of chords and scales that were always the same. It came, music comes from the world around us, and human beings make systems out of it. And uh, even something like notation, which is so difficult, um, is just a way of making a visual representation so you can remember something and do it again. Uh, so it was great training for me, but I think uh, it, it, I kept it in mind and it's a reason I, I do a lot of the things I do. And another thing about my parents is that my father was complete, he grew up in the middle of the United States in Iowa, if you know where that is. And uh, he, his whole family was a, was a real popular culture family. So um, they didn't know anything about classical music. Um, it was all like Broadway and movie music and pop popular music. And my mother grew up in New York and was a very kind of uh, slightly snobby, you know, high art European culture family. So, and um, their tastes were very, very different. And I think uh, growing up with these two parents, I really had kind of a mission to find out how to bring music and technology and humanism and science and, and popular culture and serious culture together. And so I've kind of devoted my, my career to that. Um, I played the cello when I was little. And, um, but for me, uh, like, the, like uh, the Rite of Spring was a huge change for anybody living in 1913. For me, when I was a little kid, the big, big change, like that changed everything for me was this. So I guess you know what this, anybody remember what year that came out? This is, this is a te your test. Somebody must remember. 67, great. Who said 67? Awesome. Okay, so, so, and, so this, and the second question, which people don't usually get actually, um, is can you think of something that was absolutely unique, happened for the first time when the Beatles put out Sgt. Pepper's? There were a few things, but one thing's really important. Uh, anybody have any ideas? Something that the Beatles did, you guys must know. The first, something they did for the first time in Sgt. Pepper's. No? Say again? You're the first, that's absolutely right. So he got it, um, but he's one of the workshop, he's a, he's a sophisticated composer, but, <laughs> but the answer is, Sgt. Pepper's was the first album the Beatles ever made, and probably the first album anybody ever made, that was not designed to be performed live. In fact, it was, it was designed not to be performed live. The Beatles had been playing in larger and larger venues. They had the famous concert at Shea Stadium in New York where the sound system was awful. They couldn't hear each other. They were playing out of tune. People were screaming. They just hated the experience. And also at the same time, they, through uh, the help of uh, George Martin, their producer, they realized all the magic that you could do in a recording studio, that you could make blends of instrumental sounds and sounds from nature and, and recorded sounds, synthetic sounds. Uh, it, it, you could do magical things in a studio. You could, every single note could have a different combination of sounds. You could do it in a way you'd never, ever perform live. 
Um, and listening to it became a new kind of experience. So when this came out and I was a kid, it changed my life because I loved the music. I had a big fight with my mom because it was the first music we didn't agree on at all. And, um, but I also thought, this is fantastic because it's popular and it's also serious. It has all these layers. It's, it's great music. Um, and it's fantastic that I can listen to it with headphones and have this experience, but there's something wrong. There's something, even as a kid, I felt there was something missing if it couldn't be performed live. And since I was a cellist, I love live performance, and I think the exchange of music between real human beings, uh, you know, like communication, is one of the fundamental reasons to make music. Um, I became obsessed from that point in seeing whether you could combine the kind of complexity and beauty and precision and layering that you can do with technology with the ability to shape things live. And so I've been working on this kind of problem for a lot of years. And uh, I went to Juilliard myself and went to a bunch of places, lived in Paris, but eventually ended up at MIT at this place called the Media Lab. Uh, it's in Boston, it's actually in Cambridge, the other side of the river. And it's a very, very unique place. Um, it's kind of, MIT is this great institute for science and technology. It also has a lot of other things, but the Media Lab is the place where we think about how science and technology can improve people's lives, as simply as that. And we try to bring people together from many, many different backgrounds. Um, we used to call the Media Lab an interdisciplinary place, which is kind of a traditional term. Now we call it anti-disciplinary, um, because we're looking for ways to solve problems that don't respect the normal boundaries between what you need to learn to solve this problem. Uh, you learn whatever you need to to solve the problem. So for instance, uh, some of my colleagues, uh, the person who has the laboratory right next to mine is someone named Hugh Herr, and uh, he studied biology and physics, <clears throat> but he also, when he was a teenager, lost both his legs in a, in a mountain climbing accident. And he was so upset with how bad the artificial legs were that he decided to devote his life to making artificial parts of your body that are better than your physical, real parts of your body. And he's really devoted to, so he's, he's one of the very best intelligent prosthetics designers in the world. And uh, he's, we're making music instruments and he's making new bodies. And, and actually, um, he still uh, climbs mountains quite a bit. <clears throat> and when he does, uh, one second. When he climbs, he takes a bag and in the bag, he has 10 different pairs of legs. <clears throat> he has legs for ice and legs for uh, little holes in the rocks and legs for 10 feet long, so if he has to stretch, and uh, legs that bend. And, and he says, uh, Todd, if you climb a mountain, you can't do that. So, so he really, you know. And there's a guy uh, right down the hall named Ed Boyden, and he's trying to do, he studied physics and biology as well, and he's trying to make the same kind of innovation with your brain. So he actually has incredible new techniques to shine light inside your brain and measure individual neurons. And he believes in our lifetime we'll be able to find out actually where a thought is in your brain and maybe mind read, read those thoughts and hopefully help you if you're having trouble connect thoughts, all, all kinds of things. And you might have heard that uh, President Obama in the US, one of his big initiatives is to make a map over 10 years of the entire human brain and uh, Ed is one of the people who's uh, one of the central scientists for that project. Um, we make robots, we specialize in making robots that work with people. The group is called sociable robots. So they're, not, they're not just industrial robots or fun robots, they're robots that help people learn or might help people heal. Uh, they might measure a child if a child is sick, they might help with communication. Um, we make fuzzy robots that, yeah, yeah, robots that don't feel like robots but um, do interact with human beings. Um, there's a huge thought about the future of education. So some of my colleagues make software that allows uh, young people to create their own uh, video games or interactive environments, like the things at this workshop. Uh, use a graphic language to do it, so you don't need to know programming to do sophisticated things. But by using this language, which is called Scratch, you learn how to program and you learn about mathematics. So it's a kind of, um, I would say, subversive way of learning programming and mathematics. Um, and there are all kinds of design and art projects uh, that cross many, many different boundaries. In my own group, uh, we do many, many things uh, to think about the future of music, how to perform it, what it sounds like, who makes it, what context it exists in. And um, 
Two of uh, the, the stars in my group are here today and have been working at Artez all week. Um, Ellie Jessup, you want to raise your hand? There's Ellie. <clears throat> um, before Ellie came to the Media Lab, she did a first college degree in computer science and conducting and choreography. So th we call it the three C's, and uh, it's very unusual. So at the Media Lab, she's become an expert in measuring the expression from a human gesture, whether it's your body or your voice, and how to understand how people express themselves and how to use that to enhance what a professional performer can do on a stage or maybe what uh, a, just an ordinary person who might want to express or shape an environment might do, and she'll show you more about that later. And Peter Torpe, Peter is... Peter's in the back there. <clears throat> and Peter came to the Media Lab with a background in programming, graphic design, theater, and especially in connecting all the different uh, aspects of, of putting a complex production together. Like if you think of making a film or making an opera where you have a story and you have visuals and you have lighting and you have music, you have the overall structure. Uh, Peter thinks about, is there a language, a common language that can describe all of these different layers of a, of a performance or of a creative process? And so for his PhD work, he'll tell you a little more about this later. Uh, he's actually created a new kind of language, a new notation called media scores that allows teams of collaborators to share whatever skill they have in the same language and to shape, if, for instance, if you shape that beautiful line at the top, it might change at the same time the way the music sounds, the way the lighting in your production goes, um, the way it might change something about the, the, the uh, storyboard, actually, um, it, it, anything. So um, it's quite remarkable, I think, and very relevant to the kind of different disciplines you all have in, these, uh, in, in the schools that are um, connected right here at Art Artes. So I just want to give you a little idea of, of some of the main things we've been thinking about uh, before Miriam and I uh, uh, have a bit of a discussion. Because I play cello, one of the first things that I wanted to work on was how to make something like Sgt. Pepper's, something as complex as that, played live by a performer. Um, so we did, this is Yo-Yo Ma a little while ago. Um, and um, what we did with Yo-Yo is we built a new cello that we call a hyper cello, this whole field is called hyper instruments. The idea is to have an instrument that measures not just what music is being played, but how it's being played, and in some sense, why it's being played. What's the meaning of it? What's the interpretation? So um, in Yo-Yo's case, um, he has a Stradivarius, fantastic, one of the best cellos in the world, and we wanted to measure the way he played. And um, when we started talking about putting glue and tape and little tacks on his Stradivarius, he He's a really nice person, but he didn't like that idea very much. So, so we built a new cello that um, is made out of wood, but has all kinds of sensors built into the wood. Um, it has measurement on the fingerboard under the strings that physically measure where your fingers are. Um, I'll play, if you could see, see that again. If you look at his right wrist, there's a, a blue device on it. And that actually sits here, has a little elastic around your wrist, and it has a little arm which measures this degree of motion and this degree. And it turns out that measuring the motion of the bow hand uh, is a very good way of measuring, uh, if, I know some of you are string players, but if you're a string player, you know that all of the expression from playing strings comes from the way you bow. I mean, of course, you have to play in tune, but the real expression like breathing comes from bowing. And you can measure the bowing techniques, like is it legato, marcato, spiccato, um, anything, really from measuring the pattern of the right wrist moving. So that's what we use that for. Um, we measure the sound and we measure a lot. Uh, we're kind of specialists in measuring everything that comes off of the bow. So uh, how fast it's moving, the friction of the hair against the string, the angle, how much bow is being used, what part of the bow, things like that. And all of that information gives the instrument and the computer a sense of how the music is being phrased and then depending on how it's played, the cello can turn into anything. It can turn into a voice, it can turn into an electronic instrument, a melodic line can turn into a whole orchestra, um, all being controlled just by the way the music is being played. Um, so I'll give you one little example. This is something from about three years ago. 
Uh, these days, we don't need the special cello anymore. You can just use a regular instrument with a microphone. We do use the special bow because the bow gives all this extra information. Uh, this is a young cellist in London named Peter Gregson. And uh, you'll see him surrounded by a towers of LED lights. Uh, he's playing acoustic cello. All the music he's playing is, comes out of the actual cello sound he's playing. So sometimes it's crazy, sometimes it's very harmonious. It, it all comes from what he's playing. It's all controlled by the way he plays. And the lighting is controlled by the same software. Uh, that software was actually written by Peter. So it's, it's one of these unified systems that it, it enhances the cello and gives it um, a light enhancement as well. So this is just a little bit from a piece called Spheres and Splinters. <laughs> So if he plays that note with that kind of bowing, he can turn off the lighting system, stop the piece, turn off all the interaction. Um, we often use these kind of techniques to build projects, not just for music and light, but for every uh, artistic element together. Um, opera has been something that's interested me uh, since I started my career, and I've done a bunch of operas. None of them are very traditional operas, but they're all kind of unusual. Um, the most recent uh, is called Death and the Powers, and it's an opera with a bunch of robots. Um, it was uh, produced and supported by a group in Monaco. It was actually it was Prince Albert of Monaco was the, was the main uh, patron, and um, we did this crazy 21st century opera with robots and premiered it at the Opera House in Monaco, which is one of the most traditional, very beautiful opera house, but, you know, with gold kind of statues all over the place and you, you can see this we were afraid the whole place was going to collapse when we were there because we had about 200 speakers around the room and luckily the robots behaved and the opera house didn't fall down so that was good um, yeah, but it's an original story about a man uh, kind of in his 60s his name is Simon Powers and um, he kind of wants to live forever but he's actually tired of the world. We, we, th we thought of him as a kind of combination of somebody like uh, Walt Disney and Bill Gates and I don't know if you know Howard Hughes who was kind of a, a recluse in the United States. Um, somebody powerful but also kind of strange. So um, it's almost as if Bill Gates one day woke up and said, I've spent billions of dollars of my money to try to make education around the world much better and I've tried to cure disease and you know what? It's not getting better fast enough. So I'm just tired. I want to leave the world and somebody else can worry about this. So, so this guy Simon Powers wants to leave the world, but he wants everything about himself, his personality, his ability to connect with all his family, his loved ones. He even wants to keep manipulating his businesses when he's gone. So he, he f designs a way to download himself, leave everything about himself in his environment when he leaves. So the opera starts where Simon Powers is about to turn on what he calls the system and he's about to leave and he says, it's almost ready, see you later, I'm out of here. And the opera is really about what happens when he leaves because he does. And the singer, he's a very famous uh, singer named uh, James Maddalena, um, he leaves the stage after about 15 minutes and then he's gone until the very end of the opera. But everything about him is measured. He goes down with the orchestra. And everything about him is measured so that everything you see on stage, the furniture, the walls, um, the, the objects, and the sound is all influenced by his behavior when he's off stage. So the idea is he is still there. It's not a trick. He really is because we're measuring him. Um, but he's not 100% there. So different people in the opera, like his wife, Evie, um, 
they have to decide if they like him in this form. Can they still communicate with him? Evie actually kind of likes him when he's gone. I, she, she has a connection with him. She wears headphones for a lot of the opera and hears signals from him and sings back. You don't know what she's hearing. Um, and in the middle of the opera, there's a, um, there's a big chandelier, chandelier, uh, gigantic in the middle of the stage. And at first you think it's just for light, but then it starts moving and then it starts vibrating and you can hear his voice. You can hear Simon's voice through these strings. And then it comes down onto the stage and uh, Evie, the wife, is on stage and the chandelier closes around her. She's like trapped in it. And she has a duet. It's like a love duet or a very sexy kind of erotic duet where her husband, Simon, is in this chandelier with his voice vibrating and she's singing and she can change his voice by leaning into the strings. She can play the instrument kind of like a harp by plucking the strings. So it's uh, kind of an unusual sort of sex scene between a woman and a chandelier. That's not too many of those. Um, this, and uh, in some ways the main character is um, Simon's daughter whose name is Miranda. She's kind of taken care of her father her whole life. She has, doesn't have much of a life of her own. And um, she misses him incredibly. And of all the characters, she's the one who feels like, yes, she can communicate, she can talk, he can talk back, he's there, but something's missing. He's not the same. And so she really struggles with whether she is going to join him in this new existence or whether she's going to stay in her body, stay as a human in her normal form. Um, and uh, she actually, I'll show you the video in a minute. She, um, she's the only one who decides actually to stay and not follow her father. There's a chorus of robots. So um, the robots are like Simon's um, intermediary. They're, they're kind of in between himself and the system that he built. So they're kind of left to communicate with humans. Um, there are nine of them on stage. Uh, we designed them so that they wouldn't look uh, like humans but they would kind of act like humans. Uh, we thought you'd feel closer to them and more, have a more complicated reaction if they didn't have arms and legs and eyes, but if they could move in very expressive ways, um, they move up and down, the, the, the lighting is very complex, they float on stage, they respond to the music, they're, they're quite beautiful. Um, and actually here's just a little bit of video uh, just showing how the robots move. <laughs> delve into a world where opera and MIT technology collide. Opera is about the moment when music and voices, singing in particular, becomes drama. How can we make robots that will be alive and expressive? We wanted these robots to feel like they had human reactions but didn't look anything like humans. Uh, the first man was Robert Pinsky, who wrote the libretto, a famous poet, and uh, Diane Paulus uh, was the uh, director. The whole stage is a kind of robot. They're gigantic walls. Each wall has three sides. Uh, they also float on stage. They have eyes and ears, so they look at the characters, they look at the choreography, and they move on their own. Um, we, on, the, on the panels, we don't use them like video walls, so we don't show clear pictures. We show something that feels kind of like the soul or the inner life of Simon Powers. Uh, so we show gesture and light and movement. Um, sometimes it just looks like that, the light might explode. And uh, the characters, that is Simon Powers, so the characters uh, react to this. Um, we measure Simon Powers with an, an extension of this hyperinstrument technique that we call disembodied performance. This is something that was really invented by Ellie and Peter. And the idea, e even with a cello like uh, the one we built for Yo-Yo Ma, which is very sophisticated, um, Yo-Yo plays the cello on stage, you see the performer, the performer knows exactly what's being measured, my fingers, the sound, my bow, and the idea is for the performer to practice and be in control of this new instrument. With this environment, we wanted to measure things that the performer could control, like what he was singing, something about his gestures, but we also wanted to measure things that you're not consciously aware of, like the tension in your arms or your breathing, which, you know, if you're really singing a part, you, you can't, you know, you can't control exactly the way you're breathing. So we measure all of these things, and it gives a more complete picture of what the emotion is 
of Simon Powers at every moment and over the course of the piece. So there are many, many parameters that get captured, measured, and get sent into a centralized system. Um, the system has different things that it measures at each section of the piece. Sometimes every measure of the piece, uh, the interpretation of this information changes. Um, and all of this goes into the hall, on stage, and into the sound, uh, so that everything you see and hear is being modified all the time by what, uh, what Simon is doing. So let me play you just a short video, two minutes, which will give you an idea of how all this fits together uh, in the opera. There, now you've seen the whole opera in two minutes. You don't have to come see the, uh, the full thing. Uh, it is going next to Dallas Opera, which um, has a brand new opera house. The Dallas Opera, actually, uh, you can see on the right, it has a, um, a computer-controlled chandelier with uh, computer-controlled lighting, which is kind of like the cousin of our chandelier. So I think we're going to have a little relationship between the two chandeliers when we go to Dallas. Um, anyway, uh, besides making these kind of sophisticated instruments for virtuosi and making operas, um, we're also extremely interested in trying to make musical experiences that anybody who likes music can participate in. And we've been doing this for a long time. So we made a project called the Brain Opera, uh, for, first for Lincoln Center in New York, and then it traveled around the world and was in Vienna for about 10 years. Um, a whole room full of instruments that measure um, your movement and have video games like a music driving game where you can drive notes down a road, measure your voice and make accompaniments, touch uh, a table and make melodies, and ways to blend all of these things together into coherent pieces of music. Um, there's a sensor chair that people like Bono have played that measures your movement and turns that into all kinds of music. And uh, this was kind of a, a first project, it got a lot of attention actually, a first project to show that it's possible to make interesting musical experiences that don't require many years of technical practice to allow you to start to, to manipulate and shape and understand uh, some of the most interesting qualities of music. Um, I was thinking, uh, I don't usually show this, but just quickly, we, we actually built a project in Essen, right near here, um, that opened in 1998 and was open for about seven years. Uh, we designed it for RWE, the, the elect electricity company for their 100th anniversary. And this was an entire building. Did anybody ever go there to the, it's the Meteorit? I mean, it was close by. But anyway, um, it, we built this in an old um, coal mining area. And um, the idea, the whole building was underground. And the idea was um, a, a meteor, a, you know, a meteor from the sky 
crashes into the earth, a meteor from some future world, and it crashes into the earth, and you see a little bit of it above ground, and uh, then you go in, open a door, and there's this huge uh, experience underground. Um, so the, the great thing about this is that it, the entire experience, the architecture and the visuals, the rooms, the music, and all the interaction was all designed together. So it was like a permanent theme park for future music experiences. And it, it was one of the more exciting projects we ever did. It was incredible. There were rooms where uh, the, the one on the top right was a room completely filled with fiber optics, where depending on how many people were in the room and how they behaved in the room, uh, the, the optic, the color, the entire room glowed in different ways and the music was all vocal music changed. Um, on the bottom left was a huge kaleidoscope of mirrors where again it measured the people in the room and there were, I don't know, I can't remember how many loudspeakers, but speakers everywhere where the sound would change depending on who was there. The one in the middle uh, was called the trance flow room where you walked into not a big room but a curvy room where all the walls were filled with rubber kind of, they looked like little animals or something, and depending on how you touch them, um, 50 people at the same time could make a composition together, and you walked through, and the sounds actually started at the front door, went through the room, and came out the other door with images. But it was a great project, and um, you know, we should all have the, I, I would love to do something like this again, to design a whole building where, where uh, the whole experience is designed together. Um, I, we thought of it as kind of a walk-through opera. Uh, we designed a lot of instruments for kids. This is a squeezy instrument um, that measures actually the electricity in your fingers when you touch the thread. So it tells where your fingers are and how you're, how you're squeezing the ball. Um, that can be used to change musical qualities. Uh, we make software that allows children and others to make music by uh, drawing lines in color. This is called Hyperscore and it prints out music notes. And um, some of you may play Rock Band or Guitar Hero. Anybody? No? Yes, a few. Anyway, that came out of our group also. So all of this work, um, the software and um, all of this technology um, went into Rock Band and Guitar Hero and some of my students started that. It's right next to the Media Lab. Um, and uh, I know there are a lot of people here. How many of you are in the uh, music therapy division? Oh my God, everybody. <laughs> this side of the room, oh gee. Well, maybe we can talk more about this in questions because I, you know, I don't have time to go into it in, in detail, but uh, especially after doing the work with um, children and hyperscore around the world and um, basically going, this started about, oh, with the, maybe around the year 2000 um, when we started making toys and especially this composing language and going with orchestras uh, like the BBC Symphony and the Berlin Philharmonic and going uh, basically into schools, uh, usually for children age 8 to 12, and usually for schools where they didn't have music in the school and maybe places where people had never been asked if they wanted to make music. And we didn't just say make music, we said, would you be interested in creating and composing your own music? And would you be interested in having the BBC Symphony play your piece? And actually in a lot of places, the kids didn't even know who the BBC Symphony was, they didn't care at all. But um, the idea of having like a hundred people play your music, that was kind of a cool idea. Um, and what we found is, it, you know, we had to learn a lot about tuning the software and also how to run a session so that um, we could help people find their own voice and write something that really was their music. But it developed pretty quickly and in every place we went, we found that um, not only did children's interest in music grow, but their interest in their own abilities, the ability to make something themselves, the ability to be taken seriously by adults, um, the ability simply to, to stay in school grew enormously. And it just got us thinking about the different effects that music could have in, in all kinds of different uh, settings. And so one of the settings that started to interest me was uh, general health, uh, either just well-being for anybody, but also um, how music can help people who have various uh, uh, health problems. And so we, again, I could give a whole talk about that, but we do a lot of different work in music and health, some of it for diagnosing problems. So um, we have music tests that can uh, diagnose um, Alzheimer's disease very early, earlier than other techniques, uh, which is useful because you, can, you can't cure Alzheimer's, but you can start treating it and slow it down. 
um, we do a lot of work with making this kind of hyper instrument to allow people to express themselves who wouldn't ha don't have any other way of doing it. So uh, this is somebody named Dan Elsie who uh, lives in a hospital right near Boston. He's in his early 30s. And we went to that hospital to do a hyperscore workshop, uh, just like we would do with school children. And uh, Dan took the workshop, and it turned out that he was really interested in music and had a lot of interesting musical things to express and started making hyperscore pieces. Uh, at first, we helped him because uh, he has cerebral palsy, so he doesn't have incredibly good control, perfect control over his muscles. So we made a tracking device for his head uh, that was pretty good, and pretty quickly he learned how to make all the lines and select things himself. He didn't need any help. And it turned out his pieces were really, really good. So we had them played by an orchestra in Boston. And then we, people really liked his music, so we said, uh, would you like to perform your music? And um, he really liked that idea a lot, so we made a better head tracking device, which worked very much like Yo-Yo Ma's bow, except for somebody like Dan, because he, he can't make exactly the same motions. I mean, if you're Yo-Yo Ma, you know that if you want to move the bow in exactly the same way every single time, you can do that. And if you want to change it a little bit in a certain way, you can do that too. Dan imagines exactly what he wants to do, but he can't always make his body do that. So we have to write software that can learn, first of all, how he wants to play a piece, and then can learn what his motions are suggesting and when he actually is doing exactly what he wants to and not exactly what he wants to. So it's a very customized instrument, a kind of personal instrument. Um, so we designed that for him to use with his head, and now he performs quite often his own music, and he actually mentors, he's a remarkable, remarkable person, so he mentors people all around Boston in hyperscore and just in general in, in um, being able to persist and do what you want to. So here's just a tiny video um, from Dan playing at a conference a few years ago, uh, just a few seconds, but it's online and it's worth looking at the whole thing if you ever want to. So in Dan's case, you can't cure cerebral palsy. It's never going to do away with the disease. But it, it is the main way now that he can not just communicate, but when you see him playing, when he writes a piece, when he shares that, um, you see who Dan Elsie is. You see this person. You don't see somebody with this disease. It's his only way of showing that. And also, many of his symptoms, although they can't be cured, as I'm sure all of you know through your work, many of his symptoms are incredibly controlled when he is making music. So his, his, he can control his movements many, many percentages better. Um, you know, he can focus. Um, it's, it's quite remarkable. So this is work that we're going to continue to do. Um, I've used up a lot of my time, but can I tell one, talk about one last project? Um, it's always fun to talk about the last project you did. So um, it just so happens that the project that we just finished is in some ways the first project we ever did that combines the different elements of the work I've been telling you about. So something like the opera or, or work with Yo-Yo Ma, the goal is to make a new kind of music with a new kind of instrument and have it played by the best people we can find in the world and have anybody come just to listen to it. The work with Hyperscore and Rock Band and Guitar Hero is an attempt to make environments where people can enjoy music who are not professionals. And with this project, we tried to do both. So the Toronto Symphony Orchestra uh, asked me to write a new symphony for them. And I told them that what would interest me would be to see if we could find a model where experts, professionals, could work together with the general public, not just as mentors and teachers, 
but to make something together, to really collaborate. Uh, the way that we collaborate when we put together a team for an opera, and we might have 55 people working on different aspects of the opera to, to make it. No, no one person could make that alone. Um, so I said, I'll, I'll write a piece for the orchestra if I can invite the whole city of Toronto to write it with me, to collaborate and make this piece together. And uh, to me, it would be a success if people say yes, and second, if the piece is an interesting piece of music that people want to listen to, and if it feels like it's my piece, but it also feels like it's the piece of everybody who participated. And if we can get some large distance on that, in that direction, I think this is worth doing. So the orchestra said yes, which is too bad because it was a really hard project. It took a long time. It was very difficult to figure out how to do this. Um, but I'll give you a quick idea of what we did. So how do you get a whole city to collaborate on something? Uh, the first thing we did actually with Peter was to, to say, let's make a kind of story for this piece and let's tell everybody what the story is in the simplest way, a visual way, before there's any music at all. So we made a kind of picture of the piece and this was the original picture uh, a year ago in mid middle of June 2012. We sent this out to, to the city of Toronto and said, here's this piece. Here's what it looks like. We're not going to tell you much more except that it has this shape. You can tell something about the texture. Sometimes it maybe is more synchronized. Sometimes it's more fluid. And actually, even at the beginning, you can see there are little words at the bottom. I divided it up into sections. So different sections. One section might have been about people telling stories about the city. One might be imagining what Toronto's like if you're not in Toronto, like if you're in the Netherlands and thinking about Toronto. Another is like being right down in the middle of the streets. What does the city feel like there? So we, we sent out this picture, and I also at the very beginning divided the kind of relationship with the public into three different forms. The first was called yours, and I said, for yours, I'm going to invite you to send me things. I might invite you to send me sounds of the city that you record, or melodies that you make, or something you sing, and I'll send out these requests periodically, and you send me things, and we'll discuss them and trade them back and forth. Uh, the second was mine, and uh, I said, I'll make some things. I, I might make some chords or some melodies or maybe some rhythms, and I'll send them out to you, uh, either to tell me what you think or to modify them or to share them with each other or to build on them. And then I said, we'll do something called hours, hours like hours together, but also with an H, meaning uh, we'll take some time during the year, one hour, um, and either by Skype, from between Boston and Toronto, or live in Toronto, um, we'll take some idea, some music from the piece, and we'll spend an hour and work on it together and push it further. Make, maybe make a little bit of music that ends up in the piece, or make it more sophisticated, richer, and then uh, send it on. Um, so we did all of those things. Uh, the first thing I did for mine was to make a progression of chords kind of like a Bach chorale, rather strange chords, but chords that uh, had a certain emotional um, shape to them. And I sent those out to everybody and said, here's the kind of skeleton of the piece. And actually the first people I sent it to were the musicians in the orchestra. So it was a pro you know, great professional orchestra. Um, they're not used to doing creative things or getting this kind of request. So I didn't know what they would say. Uh, but I said, here are my chords. I would love it if you would write melodic material for your instrument based on my chords, if you want to add chords in between chords I've written, or if what I wrote suggests something different, you can write that and send it back to me. So I actually got quite a bit back from them. Um, oh, actually, yeah. And um, when we launched the piece, uh, I made a little six-minute piece that was a combination of my chords and what the musicians had done, what I took from what they did, and... and uh, uh, worked with that, and um, it was kind of the introduction of this whole process. So here's just a tiny bit of uh, that first bit of music.
So with this picture and the chords and this little bit of music, we started building. Uh, the next thing we did was to launch a website uh, and a blog, uh, which we really tried to add something to very, very often. Videos of what people could do, questions, uh, the, uh, questions we wanted people to answer, things we wanted people to send. And so we started getting things from all over Toronto. Um, we asked for stories. Uh, we got people telling us, we actually asked, why are you in Toronto? You know, why do you live there? Why do you stay there? What brought you there? Um, and so we got all kinds of stories from the city. Uh, I asked for sounds, you know, send me, go out and record the most typical sound outside your house or the sound of Toronto that someone across the world would uh, identify as Toronto. So we got all kinds of things from transportation to skateboard parks to, it's a very big city, Toronto, actually, and uh, quite diverse. It's on a lake, so it's a lot of nature right inside this big city. It's actually the third largest city in North America now. It's bigger than, um, I think only Los Angeles and New York are bigger than Toronto. So it's quite, a, quite an amazing place. I went around uh, recording all over the city. Um, these are, if, if you like recording, um, this is a little digital recording device with um, high quality binaural microphones that you put in your ears. Um, it, it, it's really fantastic because first it looks like you're going around with your um, iPod or something, but actually the microphones are great quality. The recordings you make with them because they're in your ears uh, the separation is very realistic. It also uses the acoustics of the inside of your head. Uh, so when you listen back to them, it absolutely feels like you're in this real place. Plus, you can walk around in a city, and um, in English, we have a word which is, which is eavesdrop. I wonder what it is. I bet it's similar. You can basically spy on people. You know, you can walk up to a neighborhood and go where people are shopping and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, hear incredible stories. So I, I, I really had fun doing this. I'm, yeah. Um, and I met incredible people. One of the uh, big um, kind of discoveries for me in this project, is, you know, we work at MIT, we have all this technology. I thought that building a community of collaborators for this would mostly be done online, that we'd do our blog and we'd uh, trade information online, and that kind of worked. But early on, I realized that most of the people who were answering online were already people who were involved with the orchestra and they already went to concerts and they, it was kind of the same people. So I decided that the only real way to change this project was to go and start meeting people in Toronto. So we hired somebody who knew the city very well and over months I went up and, and worked with all kinds of different groups, you know, um, classical musicians and indie rock bands and children. Um, on the, uh, the bottom right was this group of kids who were learning hip hop um, and they were learning hip-hop to perform, but they were also learning hip-hop as a way of literally being able to express yourself through your voice, to be able to stand up and say, here's who I am, I'm here. It was an incredible program. And actually, we did a lot of recording together. We did, um, we did a, a bunch of vocal exercises. They uh, performed for me and showed me how they were using their voices. And then we just played with their voices and I recorded them. And um, like with a lot of the sounds from around the city, I, I used that as part of a texture with the orchestra going back and forth with their voices. Here's just a, a little bit of what that sounds like. I also took a lot of uh, recordings of places, uh, especially uh, just sounds, like uh, there, there are a lot of beaches in Toronto. And I worked with the youth orchestra, uh, their age about 13 to 18. And what I would typically do is take one of these sounds, like um, one of the beaches, and I'd make my own collage, not exactly just one sound of the beach, but kind of a collection to make a sort of super beach. And I'd bring it into them and say, okay, can you tell me where this is? Yeah, it's a beach. Which beach? Can you tell? Okay, great. That's Cherry Beach. Okay, let's listen. Now put your instruments down and let's see if we can make as close to that sound as possible just with your acoustic instruments. Can, you, can we make the beach? So this is what that sounded like. Here's the, the real sound. And here's what we did with our instruments. Okay.
frankly, with music like that, who needs nature? You know, that's like much better. Uh, we used hyperscape. We did so many, I was working with so many different groups of people that each group, I had to invent kind of a different project because the tools and the way of communicating and what music they wanted to work on was just different. So um, it, was, it was quite something to discover that. Um, Hyperscore worked very well for school kids and we made a really good relationship with the whole public school system in Toronto. It was fantastic. So many, many kids around town, uh, the, the idea was to write an individual piece that expressed something about Toronto to you. Uh, we gave them some of the core materials like my chords and my melodies to use if they wanted to. And we got an amazing number of pieces. I took about 20 of those pieces and turned them into orchestra music and then turned those into a kind of puzzle for one of the sections of the piece where you hear the different pieces and they all kind of turn into, um, uh, they kind of come together. Um, we did workshops with kids all around town. Um, amazing uh, ideas and one of the great things to see in this context was how thrilled all the kids were not just with their own pieces but with what their friends had done and they were kind of proud to hear usually kids are like well that's my piece I don't really care about the others but this was really fantastic um, these two kids uh, Gabe and Andy uh, made one of my favorite pieces um, here's <laughs> First, me and Andy, we were kind of thinking about what to do. We were trying to, we were trying to make some music. Whoa. I forgot how loud it was. No, what? No. Yeah, we need something else. So first you have to start out with the bass, so um, pick your instruments on the instruments, and then you pretty much just have to put them, put them where you want, make them sound nice, make them how, however you want it to sound and make it interesting. And then we named it the Art Gallery. So everybody had a different idea for their piece. Their idea was to make a piece about the, you know, Frank Gehry is, um, Frank Gehry built the main art museum in Toronto. And um, that's what they made their piece about, the Art Gallery of Ontario. More specifically, they made their piece about going to the gallery to look at Canadian art, if you can imagine. Uh, that's what they thought about, it was amazing. Um, so their piece uh, sounded like this. Oh, it looked like that, actually. It's, it, and um, now I'll just show you a tiny bit of a few of these pieces together in the orchestra as they're heard in the final piece, starting with theirs. exciting to work with their pieces and, and turn them into something slightly different. Um, the last kind of thing that we did, once the piece started to be written and there, were, there was more and more music, um, we made some special apps that we ran online, you can actually still find them, um, where you could take parts of the music that were being composed and make your own versions of them and then send them to, to the community and send them back to me. Uh, so the first one we did was called Constellation, where we could take any number of sounds that were recorded around town or collages of sounds that I made, feed them into the uh, software. The software automatically broke the sounds up into little bits, analyzed all the sounds according to multiple qualities, loudness, softness, uh, the, the timbre, the actual sound quality, the shape of the sound, um, loudness and softness, and put them in this kind of constellation like a star map where the closer sounds are, resemble each other more. And then you can draw your mouse over it and make compositions by connecting these sounds. You can record your lines. This is kind of a score, the line that connects these sounds, and then play them back, put them on the internet, listen to other people's compositions with the sounds, edit other people's compositions. Um, and this is a little bit what it looks like when you're playing with it.
pretty fun. So there's a whole library of those online. I listen to all of them to find textures and to think about textures to use in the piece. Um, Peter wrote this app, uh, which you can see is based on the media scores. This one, I put the main melody for the piece online before the piece was, before I had written the orchestration for it. And uh, when you open up the app, the line is just a, a, a white line that follows exactly the form of the melody. And then the little lines on the top, you can take a virtual paintbrush, like a spray paintbrush, and change the color and texture of that line. And in doing so, you make it a version for full orchestra with all kinds of variations. So you're varying the line, varying uh, the accompaniment just by coloring that original line. And this is another one that uses a different version of media scores where I took the finale and the finale of the piece, all of the different elements come together uh, in, a, in a kind of dance. So it all synchronizes even though the rhythm is very unusual, um, kind of like the Rite of Spring. Um, and when you open up the app, it is just this single white line, but you can then bend the white line. And when you bend it, you're bending the structure of my melody. So what I said was, here's the beginning of the finale, 30 seconds, but you can make your own version of the finale uh, that might be a minute or three minutes or whatever you want. And by drawing these colored lines in the background, uh, you make up an, uh, an accompaniment as well. So um, this is what that sounds like um, in the computer version. So we had many people make these. I thought about, I listened to them all. I thought about it as I was making my version of the finale. And then I finally wrote out a finale just for instruments. Um, and here's a little bit of what that ended up sounding like. So once I'd done all of that, done all of this collaboration, collected all this material, I went back to my studio and wrote out the final music. I had a computer, but I wrote a lot of it out on paper like I often do. Um, that had to turn into an orchestral score because this is for full orchestra, so I had to write all of this stuff out into normal parts so that all the players could play it. Um, originally, it was going to be just an orchestra on stage playing, but it turned out that once we'd done this whole project, we realized that we had to have some visual component so during the concert, people could see what all the, who had done what and what the process was. So Peter made a visual on two huge screens in Toronto Symphony Hall that accompanied the piece. Uh, we had a very sophisticated sound system so the sounds of the city and the acoustic instruments could be combined. And um, Toronto has one of the largest towers, freestanding towers in the world called the CN Tower. They got very interested in the project and allowed the, the live performance of the piece to be synchronized with the lighting on the tower. So again, Peter got to make an entire lighting program where you could listen to the streamed audio on your mobile phone if you weren't in the hall and stand anywhere in Toronto and see the, the main tower in the city uh, have a show synchronized with the music. Um, and that was all streamed live by the Canadian Broadcasting Company. So it was a pretty crazy project after all. Um, and I'll just play you the one minute from the end and then I'll make a couple of comments and be done. Here's, oh, oh, oh actually before that I was gonna say, we started out with the picture that I sent out to everyone. So this was the picture before there was any music. And here's the picture of what the piece actually looks like now that it's finished. Which is kind of interesting. You can see that there are many things about it the overall shape is similar, but there's much more detail. There's more contrast. So the sections, you know, as the material started developing, I thought differently about what would make sense and what would be a good trajectory. You know, it still had the same overall sense of exploring the city and, and finding some sense in it musically, um, but a lot changed as the piece developed. So 
had a nice similarity but also difference after the process. Uh, we premiered it just two months ago in March, and here is the last minute of the piece. That's a Toronto Symphony. So I'm kind of a masochist, and uh, even though this was a, it was a fantastic project, it was very hard. Um, um, but I'm doing another one right now. <laughs> I started the next one immediately. So if you're interested, um, I'm working on a, a project uh, with the city of Edinburgh for the Edinburgh Festival for this summer. Uh, so the, the new piece gets premiered on August 27th in Edinburgh. If you, it's not that far if you want to come. And uh, I'm actually going up tomorrow to uh, work with the orchestra and to record around the city and to meet people there. Um, so we're trying to learn from what happened in Toronto. And this, this model, though, of collaborating, seriously collaborating with people of all levels of, of training and background and interest is, I think, something incredibly important for... Uh, the future of a healthy artistic life, and it's certainly something that I'm going to uh, continue doing. So in closing, I wanted to say that uh, especially being here and seeing this incredible collection of different artistic schools that with Artes and the different institutions which have come together this week uh, to work on these workshops with computer scientists and people from all different disciplines, I, I, one thing we've been thinking about at the Media Lab is that if you think of kind of what are the main traditional arts, you know, they're if you look in, like in Wikipedia, um, until about 100 years ago, there were six sort of major arts that were labeled, and there they are. And uh, in, um, uh, I think, 1912 or something like that, cinema was added as, you know, if you look it up, cinema is called the seventh art. And so these are all kind of distinct arts. And even today, you're probably all majors in one of these arts and not others. And you don't see video games here, and you don't see interaction here. What I, look, what I look when I look at you know, traditional art training or, or pretty much any of these disciplines these days, or if you look at a concert, um, just yesterday we were at the Concertgebouw in, um, in Amsterdam, which is you know, a very established, rather conservative orchestra. And they were talking about concerts that they're thinking of doing with people where people can bring their iPads and maybe have different experiences at the same concert on stage. You know, if the Concertgebouw is talking about that, I was, first of all, really surprised. Um, everywhere you look, each art form is no longer satisfied with what are the traditional boundaries. I mean, uh, you know, we know theater groups that run, that, that don't work with stages at all, that, that do theater pieces in an entire city where you have to find out where the, where the production is. You know, their concerts, it's hard to imagine going to a concert now without images and smell and all kinds of experiences together. In fact, uh, there, there are people in New York who are starting to do concerts specifically where um, they're completely in blackout. So you don't see the performers, you don't see, they're live performers, but they're trying to say, okay, what would, wouldn't it be a radical experience to just go to a place and listen without, without all the other senses? What I want to say is that all the boundaries between the arts are completely meaningless now. And especially if you think about getting audiences and the public involved on a big scale, I think it's time for a real redefinition of what it means when all the senses and all the art forms come together and where professionals and audiences participate and collaborate in different ways. So we're starting to think that maybe 
there's actually another art, and maybe it's something that might be called the eighth art, which is up to us to invent, and it might be not just another uh, separate art, but what happens when all of these new senses and modes actually come together to make something bigger than the sum of their parts, bigger than opera, bigger than film, bigger than video games. And you might think of that as something that would combine all our forms and all the senses that we know of, something that really is massively collaborative, massively invites people to be creative, not just to be passive uh, in, in these experiences, something that merges, not just, not just is therapy, but actually treats us as whole human beings, uh, an artistic experience that uh, treats our lives isn't just a separate entertainment. Um, I really think this is possible. I also think that, um, you know, we kind of started it. But it's up to you guys to build this, so go out and do it. Thanks a lot.